Good morning. Our first passage today is from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The second passage is from Luke chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that, do no more. But I, shall, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. This is the word of the Lord. Julie, thank you very, very much. Uh, for reading that passage, and hello again. Um, If you've joined us since the start, my name's Andy. It's great to have you uh, with us today. I'd love it if you could to open a Bible. If you don't have a Bible near you, reach across the row, come and find one. So I'd love you to follow with me as we journey through this passage. It's some really um, heavy teaching, but actually I've been surprised this week. As you first read it, it looks really heavy. It's wonderfully, wonderfully liberating. And fantastic good news. I'm really excited to, to preach this uh, to you this morning. So please keep that open. And you'll notice on the back side of your, of your sheets, um, you'll, you'll see a little handout. If you're the sort of person who maybe had a late night last night, it might be helped to jot along um, to keep, keep awake. Do do that or doodle or whatever. Um, please follow along with me. I'm going to pray. Well, Father God, thank you that we don't need to fake it. As James said earlier on, we don't need to be all together and all sorted to come to church. Thank you that you love and welcome sinners like me. And I pray, Lord, that being a sinner, all of us, that we'll be assured of your continued love and affection towards us. uh, So much so that we don't fear man, but we fear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over the next two weeks in Luke's gospel, Jesus is going to be speaking about just that, our fears, our fears and and what we do with them. Now, I don't know if you ever ever thought about fear, but fear is a useful emotion, isn't it? If I imagine someone brought a pet tiger to church, I don't know why they do that, and unleashed it at the back, and I saw a a tiger charging down the stairs towards me, in that moment, Fear is a useful emotion to have, isn't it? It's a, it's a survival mechanism. I'm not quite sure what I'd do. Uh, maybe push James in front of me. Um, but, uh, but, but fear is a survival mechanism, isn't it? It's a way to, to, to keep going, to survive. But here's the thing. In our, particularly in the Western world, where we, we don't have many life-threatening things in our faces the whole time, our fears kind of get disordered. So much so that Instead of being afraid of real, immediate threats, we become afraid of vague, potential threats. 
So not long ago, I read an article about this enterprise in the, in the countryside um, where they, they, they do beekeeping and they invite people who suffer with extreme anxiety to come and look after bees for a week. It was a fascinating article. Uh, one of the guests on this farm was a guy called Graham and he suffered from frequent panic attacks at home. Now, this being the case, you might think putting Graham in a situation where he's surrounded by thousands of bees with enough venom to kill him multiple times over. You might think this is a terrible idea. And sure enough, when Graham was first introduced to the bees and they opened, cracked open the lid of the hive and surrounded by them, he completely freaked out. He shouts, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But each successive time he went back to the beehive, Graham something, noticed something of a change in himself. The real immediate fear came to displace his vague potential fears, which had been haunting him at home. And I, I, I'm no expert, but I gather ice water swimming has a similar effect on, on the mind. I guess the, those who go ice water swimming um, often talk about this, uh, about how the, the, the real immediate threat of hypothermia and drowning comes to displace the vague potential threats which might haunt our minds. Well, if you come back next week, Jesus is going to be addressing our anxieties in the area of money, uh, in the area of what we look like. Maybe those, those are issues for you. But our passage today, Jesus speaks to our fear of people. And it's, in essence, he asks us, whom do you fear? Because I guess who you fear, and all of us fear someone, who you fear has an enormous bearing on how you live. Now, I expect most of us, we're honest, we put our hands up, we'll admit that we do fear what people think of us. Even the most socially confident person will say that, I'm sure. So we fear the disapproval, uh, disapproval of our boss, don't we? So the boss is coming into the office at work. What do we do? Look extra busy. <laughs> you know, extra busy. Ding. Um, that's, that's, if you work with a typewriter, that's the... Uh, <laughs> where that came from. Um, <laughs> We might fear the boss, so we look extra busy. Um, we might fear disappointment of our family. Uh, they might have set a certain narrative for our life and set a certain expectation of what our life would look like, and we, and we fear not falling into that expected life narrative. We fear the disapproval. Maybe that's you. Or maybe we fear being laughed at or shunned because we're a Christian. And so our survival mechanism is just to keep quiet about our faith and keep our head down. Maybe that's you. What Jesus does in this passage today is he exposes man-fearing for what it really is. He, he exposes how fearing people can end up having this really awful control over our lives to the extent that it holds our Christian discipleship underneath the water. Jesus' strategy is the same as that beekeeping enterprise. What he's going to do is try and displace our fear of people with a greater fear of God. So as you're following along, here's the first thing Jesus teaches us. Man-fearers are fakers, and they're going to get found out. Follow with me, verse 1. Luke chapter 12, verse 1, that's on page uh, 6, uh, sorry, 785, verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, if you're here last week, you might remember Jesus has just come from the arguably the most super awkward dinner party of all time. And he's come straight from out of that awkward dinner party to be met by thousands and thousands of people, this enormous crowd. Jesus is enormously popular. We might say he's dangerously popular. The word here to describe how the crowds are trampling on one another it's the same word used back in Jesus' parable of the soils, where the sower spreads the word and then people on the path come along and trample on it. I think Luke is hinting at the fact that Jesus' current popularity 
is not to be trusted at all. This crowd is soon going to turn on Jesus, trample his word underfoot. In fact, they're going to be calling out for his crucifixion. So what does Jesus do? Well, he turns away from the thousands of people in the crowd and he says, first, I need to speak to my disciples. First, I need to warn you guys. Because soon, the temperature's going to turn up against you too. They're going to turn on me. They're going to turn on you too. And that's why he warns them about hypocrisy. Now, we thought about this last week, if you were here. The word hypocrisy is the same Greek word used to describe play actors in the Greek theatre. See, they, they wore these masks. You've got sort of various examples from the, the, um, from the, uh, the, the museums. And they, they wore these big masks on stage because the people on the cheap seats at the very back, you know who you are, they couldn't really see the actors. They didn't have binoculars back then. Um, they little red ones you have to pay 20p for. Um, they, 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 they couldn't really see, so they wore these big masks to show their emotions. They were one thing on the outside wearing the mask, a different thing behind the mask. Hypocrites present one thing on the outside and quite another on the inside. Jesus says that's the danger for you believers, you Christians. When the going gets tough, you're going to want to put on a mask. Now sure, our masks might look a little bit different to the masks worn by the Pharisees. We thought last week, didn't we, how out of a fear of man... They covered their sin with the mask of religion. They looked religious. And as we heard last week, that might be a temptation for us. But, but out of the very same fear of man, we might not cover up our sin, but we might cover up our Christianity. Trying to look normal. Trying to blend in. Pretending not to follow Jesus in public when we maintain a private faith in him. Different mask, but motivated by the same fear of man. There's plenty of examples of this in Luke's gospel. Um, you, Peter's a classic example, isn't he? What did Peter do when Jesus is on, is on trial? Remember he's there in the outer courtyard warming his hands? What does he say when, when a little servant girl questions him? Oh, oh I know, I'm not with Jesus. No, <laughs> I'm not with Jesus. I, I don't know him. I'm not with him. Fear of man. Tragically, later, many years later, Peter's in Jerusalem. He's happily eating with a bunch of Gentiles and Jewish believers. But then, but then into the city comes this circumcision party, and they're really pious religious Jews. And, and then suddenly Peter doesn't want to eat with the Gentiles. Oh, no, I'm not with them. Oh, no, I'm a, I'm a normal straight-shooting Jew, me. Out of a fear of man, he disassociates himself. Do you see, sometimes we switch masks for different occasions. Sometimes we try and look more religious. Sometimes we try and pretend we're not Christian at all. All motivated by the fear of man. So Jesus doesn't want this pharisaical mask to, to rub off on, on his, his followers. So he, notice how he calls it yeast. Does that make you scratch your head? What's yeast about? Well, it's a bit strange. You might remember in the Old Testament when Israel were being redeemed out of slavery in the Passover. They didn't have time to bake their bread. They had to leave really quickly in haste. And so Moses said, well, bake bread, but you don't have time to let it rise. Don't bother putting yeast in. And, and every year, as Jews remember the Passover, remember their, 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 how they're redeemed out of slavery, they, they would bake bread without yeast. It, bread without yeast was a picture of their redemption. Bread with yeast... Well, what, what, do you do, what happens if you put yeast into, into dough? Well, it... It kind of puffs up, doesn't it? I'm not a bake-off aficionado, but, but sort of yeast puffs up. It, the bread looks bigger. But actually, it's still the same thing. Like the Pharisees, hypocrisy, wearing a mask, might be a sign that we aren't truly redeemed. We might puff ourselves up. We might look bigger. But are we redeemed? Well, in verse 2, Jesus goes on to warn his disciples that one day all fakery is going to get found out. But just look at verse 2. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms 
will be proclaimed from the roofs. I don't know if you heard of a social media influencer or technically a mumfluencer called Clemmy Hooper. Here she is with her uh, husband and her, her four daughters. And she's made a, a living for herself, posting these glamorous, amazing pictures of her family life, all with these wonderful filters on. And, and, and the outward image you get of her family is of this endlessly wholesome, wonderfully affectionate, loving family. Looks so great, doesn't it? But then in 2019, it was revealed um, Clemmy was using fake Instagram accounts to troll other influencers. And behind the scenes, she was pouring out the most horrific vitriol and bile on all these other mumfluencers she was kind of threatened by. Publicly, uh, privately. <clears throat> was anyone shocked by this great revelation? No. Um, I I love this newspaper columnist. I think they really capture it. The the only real surprise with this story is that it doesn't happen more often. The effort her job must take would be enough to send anyone demented. Imagine having to dress your four kids immaculately, brush their hair, get them to pose endlessly for one perfect shot, and then repeat every single day. Reality is fate. And faking it, is your reality. It's a wonder her exhaustingly curated house of cards didn't collapse sooner. In the same way, Jesus says, one day it's inevitable that your mask is going to fall off and everyone sees what you're like. Um, Much of the time it it happens in this life, doesn't it? I guess like Clemmy Hooper, we, we all end up living out the deepest priorities of our hearts. We end up living out our worldview. We might try and suppress it, like trying to push a beach ball underwater. Have you ever done that at a swimming pool? It always comes popping up. It's really hard to suppress that. Inevitably, stuff gets revealed. People see what we're really like. You can't fake it for too long. But Some people do manage to fake it, but regardless, one day when Jesus returns, all will be seen. Who you are will be seen. At which point everyone exactly will know what we're like underneath. So Jesus' words here, I think they're a warning. You cannot fake it forever. You know, one day everyone's going to hear the cruel words you spoke to your spouse. One day everyone will see how you spend your money. And use your time. One day, everyone will see your internet search history. A warning. But you could flip these words and see them actually as a positive encouragement as well. Believers in in places like Iran or North Korea, uh, secretly whispering the gospel in the quiet places... One day they're assured that one day that gospel truth will be proclaimed, will be preached from the rooftops. I think what I'm trying to get at is is the most liberating thing, one of the most liberating things about being a Christian is that you don't need to be a faker. You really don't need to. Um, Christian mentioned earlier on how we, uh, as an elders team, we went away on this uh, two-day retreat. And the first session we did it's so where we sat down, we asked one another, how are you really doing? Because there, te- there is a danger, isn't it? As leaders of the church, we kind of put on a mask and we pretend everything's great at your church and then behind the scenes, it's not so great. And it's wonderful, actually, to be able to share with brothers, here are my sins, here are my burdens, here are what I'm struggling with. And instead of being met with condemnation and judgment, being met with reminded of the gospel of forgiveness and healing and getting help. Yes, your leaders are sinners. Forgiven sinners. And we keep repenting, we keep changing. You don't need to be a faker. You can confess your sins to a friend. And if they've understood the gospel, they're going to reassure you with the gospel of grace and help you to change. You don't need 
to be a faker. Well, if man fearers are fakers, he'll be found out. The positive, I guess, is that God fearers are friends who will never be forgotten. Look at verse 4. Jesus is so affectionate here. Verse 4. I tell you, my friends, my friends, personal, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, you might find this a bit strange that Jesus asks us and invites us and calls on us to fear God. You think, well, hang on. Chapter 11, he's been saying we should call God Father. He's our loving Heavenly Father. Why would I fear my Father? And then throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus has been saying, I've come to save you from hell. Why would I fear hell? Why would anyone fear God? Maybe that doesn't make sense to you. It might help to realize there there are two types of fear in this passage. And there's kind of two types of fear in the Bible. You got the, there's, there's one type of fear of God. We're seeing what God is like and seeing what we're like. You kind of fall away from God and you hide. You sort of fall, you run away and you hide. A bit like Adam and Eve did in the garden. When they saw God coming, what did they do? They run and hide. And that sort of fear of God inevitably leads us to, to sow fig leaves on ourselves. Wear a mask because I'm terrified that you come to see what I'm really like. And so what I do, I, I run away and I hide and I build a pretense. I build a facade, a mask for you to see. That's one type of fear. A fear of God leads you to fall away from him. But the other type of fear, the fear being encouraged here, is the fear that leads us to fall towards God. Seeing what we're like, seeing what he's like, this fear leads us to fall on our knees asking for forgiveness. And he grants it. Always. He offers us friendship, forgiveness, fullness. And the knock-on effect of that with others is that we realize, actually, if I can be real with God and he loves me, I can be real with, one, with, with others. I can say, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm burdened by. I don't need to fake anymore. I've been set free from that fear because I have a greater fear, displacing that fear of man. So here in verse 4, Jesus is pleading with us, don't fear man. Because if you fear man, you'll inevitably end up not fearing God in a healthy way. So at work, when people, you know, we fear mockery. So what do we do? We, out of fear for our reputations, we, 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 we keep quiet about our faith. We don't want to be laughed at during the family gathering. We might not want to die or be martyred, which is a reality even today across many parts of the world. But Jesus says here, it's not worth abandoning me simply to save your reputation. Because without me, there is no salvation. The word translated hell here in verse 5 is quite unusual. It's not hell. It's it's, it's actually a place. The word is Gehenna. It's the only time Luke uses this word in, in his gospel Gehenna refers to um, a valley just outside Jerusalem called the Hinnom Valley. Uh, Here's what it looked like in in 1854 before it was all built on. Um, This valley is repeated, mentioned throughout the Old Testament. At various times, it was a place of pagan sacrifice. People would um, often kill their children and sacrifice them, burning them on altars to false gods. And later in Israel's history, they had a great king called Josiah who got rid of all those horrific um, abuses and practices. And he said, no, we're going to use this valley from now on. He used to use it for, for false worship of false gods. Now we're going to use it as a rubbish dump. So let's get all our rubbish out of Jerusalem. Let's dump it in this valley and set fire to it there. It's a big burning trash heap. And so by Jesus' day, everyone knew what he said when he said, fear Gehenna. It's the place of ultimate dishonor, of fire. It's a a picture, a metaphor. Jesus warning us, don't go there. 
at the time of the um, English Reformation, there was a great man, a great bishop called John Hooper. And like many, he discovered, he began reading the Bible in the original languages and realized what, what the Bible taught was very different to what the church of his day had been teaching. He began to realize that we're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, and not by our works, not by our religion. And, and he was amazed by this gospel, this good news. But, but then England got a new queen, Queen Mary. She was a devout Roman Catholic, and she made it illegal to preach that message of grace alone. And shortly after she came to the throne, John Hooper was arrested, tried for heresy, and sentenced to be burned at the stake. Days before his execution, one of his, John Hooper's converts, a guy called uh, Sir Anthony Kingston, came to see him in prison. Kingston was worried for his friend, the, the friend who led him to Christ. And Kingston pleaded with him, Look, recount your biblical faith. Recount your Protestant faith. Just, just tell the queen what she wants to hear. Kingston went, consider that life is sweet. Death is bitter. To which Hooper replied, the life to come is more sweet, and death to come is more bitter. And so John Hooper went to the stake. He did not give up his profession of Christ. He feared God, not man. In verse 6, Jesus kind of takes a bit of a pivot, doesn't he? He's talking to his friends, people who he knows and loves him, and he pivots from this negative warning to a really warm and positive encouragement. Look at verse uh, 6 with me in your Bibles. He asks them a, a rhetorical question. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, you can think about it. Of all the birds Jesus could have talked about, why sparrows? Sparrows have to be the most boring birds. You know, he could have talked about majestic eagles. He could have talked about the um, enchanting songbirds. He could have talked about massive ostriches. Uh, he could have, did he know about penguins? I don't know. You know, there's a lot of birds to choose from, and he went for the, the, the sparrow, the, the drabbest, commonest, brashest, irritating, smallest, commonest bird there is. I mean, sparrows were the cheapest meat on the market. If you went to the market in Jerusalem, the, the very cheapest meat were sparrows. Just half an hour's work would buy you five of them, apparently. They're worthless. Worthless. And yet... Not one of them is forgotten by God. How much more are we, how much more are you as God's child worth th than a sparrow? How much more unlikely is it, therefore, that you will ever be forgotten? He knows exactly how many hairs are on your head. Yes, it's easier for some than others. But he knows, he knows you so intimately. He knows you so perfectly. And for every single hair on your head, for anyone who might threaten or harm you, he promises there will be a full accounting. I guess this is the irony. <laughs> this, is the, this is the great irony, isn't it? Fakers. Pharisees, fakers, they fear being known, don't they? They fear people seeing the real them, so they build this mask, they build this facade. And that's why they puff themselves up, and that's why they put on the mask. Fakers fear being known, but those who fear the Lord delight in the fact that they are fully known. That I'm, I couldn't be more known. I know, God knows me better than I know myself. He knows me amazingly. As we sing sometimes, he knows the depths of my heart and he loves me the same. You are amazing, God. It's, it's true, isn't it? So much opposition of Christians, so much persecution of Christians goes completely unseen and unrecorded in the world. 
It, it might be the cruelty of an unbelieving husband to his Christian wife. It, it might be uh, the, the low-level bullying or intimidation tactics in the workplace for a Christian. It, it might be statewide persecution of Christians in a despotic regime. A lot of it is unseen, unrecorded. It looks like they get away with it. Don't believe that. God is not distant. He's not disinterested. No, we're told here with great comfort that our knowing God sees everything. He will not forget you, my friend. He will not forget his friends. And I think that belief is inevitably going to change us. If we really believe that, it's going to transform the way we live out in the world. And this is where Jesus really lands it. Uh, The third thing we're going to see, God-fearers are faithful, forgiven, and filled. Yeah, I went mad with the Fs. Forgive me. Look at verse 8. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. Notice here, I want you all of us to notice, Jesus' assumption is that all Christians will publicly acknowledge him. There is no such thing as a private Christian. Being public about your faith in Jesus is part of the package. But let's be honest, that's, that's really hard. Um, recently, the um, comedian Frank Skinner was interviewed about his Christian faith. And he said this, I think it's a great line. It's easier to come out as an alcoholic than a Christian. That's a phenomenally profound thought. He's right. It is embarrassing in our puffed up society to admit that you need help with drink, isn't it? It's embarrassing to admit you need help. Even more embarrassing to admit that you need help from Jesus. I think that's why, as I'm reflecting on it, I think guys like me were quite drawn to academic apologetics and philosophy because in our interactions with non-Christians, we want to say, no, Christianity is strong. It's strong. And I'm a strong person because I believe it is strong. And and that is true. Christianity is strong. It is defensible academically. But I'm so leaning into that. Why? Because I'm slightly embarrassed about my message being, I'm weak. I'm a sinner, I need help, and I cannot save myself. It's harder for those words to come up my lips with my non-Christian friends than, well, let me me astound you with some amazing, flashy apologetics and evidence. Strong. Very hard to admit you're weak, isn't it? I think the solution to our shame is to picture that last day when we are standing before Jesus. And that's the the language here. You might remember Julie earlier read from Daniel chapter 7, that image of the glorious Son of Man, the one to whom all authority has been given over all people, in all places, for all time. In other words, he's the one whose opinion we should really actually care about. Not what my mate at workplace thinks about. Care about what Jesus thinks of you. Because here's the thing. If we publicly acknowledge the Son of Man, despite the threats, despite the mockery, he will publicly acknowledge you on that day you stand before him. Before all of the angels, the Son of Man is going to say, do you see Andy? So proud of him. Do you see Brian? So proud of him. Do you see Victoria? So proud of her. Why would you care about what your friends think of you? Care about what the Son of Man will say of you on that last day. But of course, there are times when we lose our nerve, aren't there? There, of course, there are. I I was encouraged to read this um, book by Rico Tice. He's an evangelist in the city, uh, All Souls Langham Place. 
And he talks in this book about the day he regrets most in his life. His grandmother is dying. She's on her deathbed. And like the rest of the family, he's there to gather around, be in the house when she dies. And like most of Rico's family, she's not a believer. She doesn't trust in Jesus. She's trusting in herself. And all of them are staying in this house. And for a week, he says, they were just waiting for the inevitable to happen. Rico says he had plenty of opportunities to go and, and share Christ with her. Plenty of opportunities to pray with her, to comfort her. But this is what he says, the quote behind me. I love my grandmother and she loved me. But the hard truth is that I love myself more than her. I wanted my family to think well of me more than I wanted her to think well of Christ. That's why I didn't speak to her. I loved myself more than I loved her, and I loved and more than I loved my Lord. My family's respect and having an easy life had become idols to me. That's why he didn't share the gospel with his grandma. Perhaps you can think of times when you've done something similar. We've bottled it. And now as you reflect on that, much like Rika does, you're full of regret. Perhaps shame. Imagine what Peter felt. I'll never abandon you, Jesus, and then denies him three times. The good news is that despite the fact that we all falter and fail, none of us are beyond forgiveness. Would you look at verse 10? Jesus says, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, this is one of those verses which, sadly, a lot of Christians rip out of context and then agonize over and worry over and anxiety. And they're like, oh, no, am I, am I really saved? Have I committed the unforgivable sin? And, and you know, some people's consciences are very fragile and you know who you are. And you might look at this and go, oh, no, that's me. Ironically, Jesus' aim is the precise opposite. He wants to give certainty and assurance to people who have failed. He's saying that there is forgiveness for people like Peter who denied him. He's saying that there is forgiveness for those like Rico who lost their nerve. He's saying that there is forgiveness for people like me and you. There is forgiveness. And, and that, that is precisely why Jesus is with this crowd heading to Jerusalem. He said in chapter 11, I think, that his face is set resolutely on that city. He knows he has to go there. Why? Because he knows what you're like. He knows what I'm like. He knows that without his death, none of us would be saved. And so he, the blameless and glorious son of man, he died upon a Roman cross in a place of dishonor outside the city. And there, as he took upon himself our sin and our shame, he did that in order to give to us honor in God's presence. As he took upon himself God's wrath, as he faced hell, Gehenna, for us, he did that in order that we might be forgiven. More than that, in order that we might be friends with God. So if you're here today and you're worried, have I committed the unforgivable sin? If you're worried about that, chances are you haven't. Because only someone who isn't worried about that would have committed that sin. If anyone comes to Jesus asking for forgiveness, he will never turn them away. He's never going to say, ah, no, sorry, your sins are too great for me. He's not going to do that. If he forgave Peter, if he even forgave the people crucifying him on the cross, well, he can forgive you. The only unforgivable sin is to persistently reject the witness of the Spirit and persistently reject the only means of salvation, which is Christ. 
Friends, don't be that person. Don't put on a mask. Admit your sin. And do you know what? Forgiveness has the power to completely transform us. It can lead us to rearrange our fears. And it, it can lead even the most timid person amongst us to become incredibly bold. And that's what, of course, happened to Peter, isn't it? After his resurrection, instead of covering up his sin and blaspheming the Holy Spirit, what does God do? Well, Peter, we're told, he confesses his sin and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. The final verses, verse 11. Jesus saying to Peter and the other disciples, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, don't worry about how you'll defend yourself or what you'll say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Let me, let me close with this story. In, in the year 1900, China was going through a resurgency. A whole bunch of radicals were very upset about the colonial foreign rule in China. And they, they, there was an insurgency. It was named the Boxer Rebellion. Um, because the, the Chinese would fight with martial arts, and the British called that the boxing. And so it was called the Boxer Rebellion. But unfortunately, a whole bunch of Christians being considered a foreign influence, they got caught up in this insurgency, in this rebellion. And at one point, insurgents completely surrounded a Christian mission station. It was full of young adults, perhaps the same age as many of you, wanting to share the good news of Jesus with their countrymen. And the insurgents surrounded this compound and they blocked all the doors, all the gates, apart from one. They ripped a cross off the wall and they threw it down on the ground by the, the open gate. Then they gathered all these young potential future missionaries. And they said, all of you can leave freely without any harm to your body. All you've got to do is trample on that cross on the way out. Renounce your faith. And you're free to go. Anyone who did this would be permitted their life. Anyone who didn't would be taken and be shot. I don't know what you'd do in that situation. Understandably, the, the students were terrified, absolutely terrified. Many of them were 18, 19 years old. One by one, they began to leave the compound. Apparently, the first seven students trampled on the cross and went on their way. The eighth student was a young girl. Instead of walking over the cross, she came and knelt before it and she prayed. Prayed for strength. Then she stood up, walked around the cross and went out to the firing squad. And strengthened by her example, 92 students followed her to their deaths. And you might know, inspired by stories like this, that the Chinese church today became incredibly bold in sharing their faith. And now, 122 years later, there are more practicing Christians in China than there are in the entirety of Europe, around about 100 million. Friends, you're not in the same situation as those people, are you? <laughs> Chances are you're not going to be asked to choose your life or your saviour. But you're aware of the situations you are in at work or with your friends or with your family. Let me encourage you. Let me appeal to you. Let your fear of God displace your fear of man. And you will be free. Let me pray. Father God, we're humbled by examples like that, that young girl, those students, and John Hooper in the past. We feel so flimsy and pathetic compared to such great people of the faith. Lord, we don't know what we'll do in facing such circumstances, but Lord, we pray that in the circumstances we are in now, with the pressures we do face now, with the masks that we're tempted to wear now just to keep our reputations Lord, give us the bravery to take off the mask, to fear you and fall towards you on our knees, knowing that you forgive us, knowing that you love us, 
knowing that we'll never, ever be forgotten. In Jesus' name, amen.